we have Hayden Pickering about to enter the stage, the creator of the educational tongue-in-cheek show Webbed Briefs and Making Future Interfaces, creator of Squar Variable Font, creator of Inclusive Components, co-creator of Every Layout, author of A List of Part, Accessibility Ally, Fighter, Punk, and Nut, beautiful orchestrator of Farts and HTML. Here is Hickering to talk about scope in CSS. Crush it, yo. Thank you, Adam. Much appreciated. Uh, I was just going to go with I'm Pisces and I'm unemployed, both of which is true. Um, so who was here in CSS Day, not in this building, it was a different building, but who was at CSS Day 2014? A hand went up before I said the year, so every year? Nice. <laughs> um, OK, so first of all, you're all old, um, and so am I. But this is like a, because that was like nearly a decade ago now which is terrifying, really. Um, but yeah, I spoke uh, at CSS Day 2014. That was the first ever conference I spoke at. Everyone looked after me really well. It's a conference I've always loved. I'm very proud to be a part of it. That's me and my friend Stephen having a chat on stage. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when I was speaking that year, I talked about my father, John Pickering. And I'm going to get this out really quickly in case anyone's worried. He's not dead. <laughs> He's still around. I saw him last week. We had a beer. It's fine. Um, but the reason that I brought him up is because I mentioned his work in that talk. He um, worked on a very specific um, bit of measurement equipment, which has a very important role at CERN, which, as we know, is where the web was born. And what it does is it regulates the, um, this is what it looks like, it regulates the current that goes into the giant cryogenic magnets that go all the way around the LHC and hold the individual particles in flow. And the thing that I told everyone in 2014 is that he actually asked me as a young man, I was only 17, quite irresponsible and not very skilled, to solder together some of the parts for this. And I made the joke that maybe you know something might go wrong because I hadn't done a very good job. And um, I might make the universe implode in on itself, which would be embarrassing for me. <laughs> Um, but not for long, because everyone would not exist anymore, so it's not so bad. Um, so in 2015, <laughs> um, a year after this conference uh, took place, I came across this article, and I was like, oh, fuck. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was a short circuit, the sort of thing that a bit of bad soldering might result in, and it is to do with the cryogenic magnets. Now, I don't think I actually cause this problem because I'd know about it. I mean, my dad would be having words with me for a start. But um, the reason I bring it up is actually more on a more serious note that um, this batch of units is the latest batch, and it's the final batch that my, my dad will be creating, which have just shipped off uh, to Geneva. And in fact, by weird coincidence, he flew uh, to Schiphol to then move on to Geneva the same day that I um, came here, which was two days ago. And these got lost in the post, believe it or not, for three weeks. But this is the last, his last job before he officially retires. And I wanted to just use this platform to say how proud I am of him. And maybe we could get a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, because he'll, he'll see the video. Um, so the other thing that came out of CERN, or uh, of that whole project, is, of course, uh, CSS, or to give it its full name, Conseil European pour la recherche nucléaire style sheets. I'm really sorry about my French accent. It's not the best. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's one thing that over the years, um, most people, I suppose to some people I'm seen as someone who's really into CSS. I write a lot about it and stuff. But people are always demanding and asking me this question. And they will actually come up to me in the street and accost me, and they'll ask this question. They'll also break into my house and leave um, angry post-it notes on my fridge to ask me the same question. And worst of all, sometimes they'll actually telephone me whilst using the toilet, which is um, rude. And it is, this is the sort of sick individual that we're dealing with. And they are all asking the same question. And that question is, why doesn't CSS have scope? Um, and this is important to them. Um, and they want to know the answer. And so I tell them. I say, CSS does have scope. 
CSS is fundamentally a scoping mechanism. CSS was invented to apportion scope. You cannot write CSS without setting scope. CSS without scope is a syntactically invalid bunch of pointless Unicode characters, which I feel is a sort of fairly comprehensive rebuttal. Um, but I also provide some examples. Um, so for example, this uh, style, this font family style here, is scoped to paragraphs. It won't style other elements, it'll only style paragraphs. So paragraphs are its scope, if you like. And, oh, I should say that this, I uh, spoke to a Google insider uh, yesterday. This is supported in all major browsers, this particular uh, <laughs> syntax. So thank you, everyone, to your efforts uh, uh, to get that pushed through. Um, similarly, this one is also um, quite well supported. I believe it's supported since Internet Explorer 1.37. Um, and it's simply more specific. It's scoping it to paragraphs, but only paragraphs which are in a side, uh, inside a sides. Um, that's scoping. That's what CSS does. This one, a little bit more complicated, scope to paragraphs that directly for it follow paragraphs that are children of a side that do not belong to the sidebar class but do include a descendant h2 heading. Actually, surprisingly, also very well supported, but it's also a form of scoping. You are scoping styles to HTML, HTML elements. So it's a fundal, fu fundamental part of CSS. There's actually only one way to do global scope in CSS, and that is to use this asterisk character. The obelisk character is deprecated. And this is the only, the, literally the only way you can, you have to very consciously do global scope. Everything else in CSS by default is scoped to something. So I kind of don't understand what they're getting at. And I'll say all of this, and of course, it, because it's like social media, the, the standard reply when you tell someone that they're wrong and they know that they are is to say, well, my point still stands. Um, and I, I find that a really weird thing to say. Like, you had a point and it was erect. I don't know what you're telling me here. But I think what they're trying to ask is, why is the local scope defined by my CSS selectors applying globally? Why is it applying in all places? Or to put it another way, why are my CSS selectors applying to everything they match and not just to stuff I secretly want them to? Or why can't CSS read my mind like a real programming language would be able to do? And the reason is quite simple. The reason that CSS, when you tell CSS to, to uh, style paragraphs, it styles all the fucking paragraphs, is because generally speaking, pick up any book and look at the paragraphs, you want them to sort of look the same. Um, it, you don't want one in Comic Sans and in pink and then the next in Georgia. You kind of want them to all, by default at least, at the, at the outset, you want them to all look the same like this, um, even between your components. So we get in this weird world where we're, by default, we're encapsulating things by modularizing stuff. But actually, a lot of the time, probably most of the time, in terms of branding, it's something that goes across those components, right? So consistency is really important. That's something that always comes up in terms of design systems. People always talk about consistency and how we must try and achieve consistency. There's different ways of doing it. And all I can say is that if you think this is a bad way of doing it for paragraphs, but this is a good way of doing it, then you might be interested in my romance novel <laughs> called The Winds Beneath His Tail. Uh, it's probably the first romance novel, which is, um, uh, thank you, <laughs> which, is, um, which is themed around uh, utility first CSS. So as you can imagine, it is profoundly erotic. Um, so this is the thing, is that CSS makes it easy to, to style alike things alike, that makes sense, right? But then you, you will want to have exceptions, like some paragraphs you might want to be a little bit smaller or you might want to adjust line height for whatever reason. And that's how it works. And some people liken this kind of cascade thing uh, to like an inverted triangle. The idea is that you do, you're styling the most elements with the least selectors or the least CSS, and then that allows you to just add in exceptions later. And I think this is why people from a computer science, let's say, background who are more um, accustomed to languages like uh, Java or general purpose languages, Java, PHP, that sort of thing. And the why they have trouble with CSS is because doing an exception feels like correcting a mistake. But that's actually how CSS is designed. You're supposed to be building in exceptions, but just doing it in a responsible and efficient way. If you take this triangle and you invert it and you take an approach where everything is an exception from the outset, 
then you get this kind of like what I would call like a sort of CSS pyramid scheme. It's just like it's not designed to do that. It's kind of illegitimate. So just a recap. I'm not finished yet. I'm just going to do a recap in the middle. Uh, CSS is um, uh, good for applying consistent style with a minimum of effort and a minimum of code. And it's bad for applying inconsistent style for some reason, and you're paid by the hour. The for some reason part is that you work for a fundamentally dysfunctional company run by psychopaths who are obsessed with capital. And that's, that's how you get into that uh, mess. Um, so a little while ago, Manuel uh, wrote this post on uh, Mastodon asking the question, what are events in CSS history that change the way you write CSS? And that's asking for trouble, frankly. But let's see what people said. So there was one reply in particular um, that I want to talk about. So the reason I've blanked it out is because if you read this whole reply at once, you will go into a permanent catatonic state. So I'm going to just reveal portions of it one bit at a time, because every part of it is, is bizarre. OK? So you ready? OK. Getting selectors was probably the biggest change I remember. Now, I'm struggling to remember. <laughs> I'm struggling to imagine CSS without selectors. Maybe that is a shortcoming of my imagination. But I can't really imagine writing CSS without you know, doing that scope thing, like saying, make the style go on this. right? Um, and actually, I did my research, and I discovered that in 1995, when there was this one of the initial working drafts for CSS, not only has selectors, but actually calls out certain types of selector and says, hey, check these out. You should try these. So selectors were there all the way back then. Um, and even this original proposal, although the syntax is very different, it does actually include a kind of selector thing here. You can see this h1 dot font size. The other thing, which is I'm bearing the lead here, some sort of calc thing going on, because you're just taking the font size, and it's like a variable. So you had all of that in the original proposal, which is uh, interesting. So are you ready for the next part <laughs> of this? Uh, can I get drum roll, actually? Maybe you could do the feet thing, <laughs> right? What? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what to say to that. I don't, I don't know what to say to that. Um, getting selected is probably the biggest change I remember and a huge mistake, in my opinion. And the reason is that's when we decided that CSS was another global namespace. So, what I'm getting here is that avoiding global namespaces, not really, the, the, the term isn't defined here, but avoiding that is so important that you would take the one thing out of CSS which actually makes CSS do something. So that appears to be the approach that's going on there. So the thing I'm getting at, though, really, is that so good is CSS at doing what it does without really any help with tooling and that kind of stuff that even libraries which are specifically designed to artificially modularize CSS give you an escape hatch which lets you just write CSS as you would normally. And that's the case with style components. You have create global style, which just injects a style sheet into your page. So you can write CSS one of two ways. And the first one is pretty simple. Just write some CSS, and you're done. You can achieve exactly the same thing with this, find a homophobe, get them to invent JavaScript, simultaneously wait for someone to come up with a sexist privacy breaching hot or not application, wait for that to evolve into a genocide fermenting social media site, which begets React, which is what controls their terrible shitty interface, and then you get styled components is a library for React, and then you get create global style. So and the thing I want to say here is that and I probably don't need to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that the first one is kind of a more efficient. You're sort of using web standards, right? But then people always come up with these sort of spurious, invented reasons why you know, we need to change all of our tooling because of this one specific scenario. And it's always a people problem that could probably be avoided another way. And they'll say, well, the problem is, what if you have one person in one part of your organization that, use, that comes up with this button class and someone in the other part of the organization which comes up with the same button class. And then you get this clash, this namespace clash. Um, 
And this isn't a CSS problem. This is a people problem. This is two people doing the same job. They should have had a conversation beforehand and worked out whose responsibilities were what, right? You don't fix that with CSS, because if you do fix it, all you're doing is enabling people to duplicate effort, right? OK. Um, so when it comes to button components or any other kind of components as someone who works on design systems, this is my approach. One, I want to create a button component. I think it's a good idea to have a button component. What I do first is I check to see if anyone else has already made a button component. So I look in the design system docs themselves, look around, ask people, do that kind of thing. Second part is a two-parter, in fact. Uh, if they haven't, then maybe I make it, if I have time, if I can be bothered, if I'm getting paid enough. Or two, if they have, maybe make a different component, or no component at all, for that matter. So you could make a component, could not make one, but not the button component. So I'm avoiding making the button component in that case. And when I make my component, if I make a component, I don't call it a button component, because that would be confusing. The problem with all of this, and it is a grave problem, and it preoccupies us a lot, I think, is that talking to people, reading your own design systems documentation, writing that documentation in the first place, and using command plus F and searching for things, and sometimes uh, people will even say writing CSS itself are all soft skills. <laughs> they don't sound that great on your CV. Like, you didn't put on your CV, I'm not a dick, or you know, I'm easy to talk to, or whatever, um, when you're applying for a front end job. Um, so you want to avoid that. You don't want people to think you're soft, right? You want people to think you're hard, like Chuck Norris or someone. And what's really, really, really hard, like the sort of thing Chuck Norris would do if he was a front-end developer, would be what? It would be create a load of random strings. So that's what we do instead. We get our computers to write our classes for us and make sure that they are uh, written such that no one could understand what they are or read them. So you get around the problem of having two button classes by having two button styles separately, which have random uh, classes made out of randomized characters. That's, that's how we go about this, and that's how all of the, the, uh, the libraries go about it. You have styled components, does that, it just generates um, randomized classes. WebC, um, interesting technology, WebC, actually. You should look into that if you haven't already. And Vue uh, does that, too, um, when you do like your scoped styling in Vue, it randomizes stuff. Um, the problem with all of this is that you have to get this monolithic library. In style components case, you'd have to have hundreds of kilobytes of React before you can start thinking about generating random class names. So I created something which was just this single purpose thing for doing this, and it's called CSS Scopulation Enterprise Max AI, TM. And all it really does is, um, I, uh, I should say, this isn't a joke thing. This is actually on GitHub, and you can use it if you want to. Um, a lot of people were, like, in my issues, being quite rude about it. Um, but yeah, it is real. Um, it's only 0.5 kilobytes, and the reason it's only 0.5 kilobytes is because it doesn't actually transform all of your CSS into an abstract syntax tree. It literally just replaces a character which represents the um, the root element. Uh, so in this case, it's I, what is this thing called? The squiggly S thing? I've only ever seen it on a Mac keyboard, but that's what I use by default. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it will be that character that it replaces, and in my case, it just replaces it with a data attribute. And it does that sort of scoping thing, if you like. Um, and the really cool thing is that it actually allows you to specify what character you want to use, which means you could actually get it to use this. And then you could feel like you're writing JavaScript when you're writing CSS, which is lovely. A real programming language. Oh, I, I do need to just read this before I go on. I have been advised to point out that this ES module does not constitute a true form of artificial intelligence in any way, and that my inclusion of the suffix AI should be treated with the same suspicion and contempt as any other product that conflates artificial intelligence. Well, kind of trivial codex. Okay, sorry, I just I had to run that off. Um, okay, so the thing is, all this is doing really is getting JavaScript or any programming language to write your selectors for you. It's fundamentally not doing the scoping any better. It's still CSS that does the scoping, and it's been doing that for a long time. In fact, this uh, kind of construct is called a contextual selector, and that has been around since 1996. So to put that into context, this was around before Radiohead released OK Computer, before Prodigy released their third album, before the classic uh, trip-hop uh, 
surf noir record um, dummy by Portishead. Before even Hansen released uh, their album Middle of Nowhere featuring Umbop. And uh, so therefore, before a lot of very confused uh, straight cis men fell in love with this uh, in the person in the middle here, who is a legal age woman. So there's that. But most importantly, it came out before this album by Entombed, who were a Swedish death metal band, and the album is called To Ride, Shoot Straight and Speak the Truth. It shortened in, uh, the short name in uh, Roman numerals is DCLXVI, which in base 10 is, can anyone tell me? Sig, sig, six. yeah, there you go. Um, and um, the reason why this is important is because when Intunes released this album, you can tell that I've got like a thing about this because it's very specific. So this is going to sound to you like uh, what it sounds like when you talk to people who are, don't do CSS about CSS probably. Um, so Intunes released this record. It was uh, kind of late in their career. And they had two kinds of critics. And those critics disagreed with each other, but they all agreed that Intunes had done something wrong. So they couldn't win. So the one set of critics said, there's nothing new here. This is all just more boneheaded, death metal, and you know, why bother? Like They're just releasing the same old shit all the time. right? What they failed to recognize is that they quite artfully took uh, production techniques and an aesthetic from uh, uh, kind of uh, trashier and lower fi genres like garage punk and punk blues and, uh, and married that with death metal, which is actually really inventive and really cool. And, that, and they kind of formed uh, a new genre, if you like, which was called death and roll for a little while. But there was only really this record and maybe one or two others. Um, so it was actually really inventive. So that wasn't fair. But simultaneously, some of their critics came out and said, this is an unexpected departure and betrays the band's death metal base. So they recognized there was innovation, but they weren't happy with it. They wanted it to stay the same. And to me, this specific record by this Swedish death metal band is very much like CSS. Because you have a group of people who say it doesn't really do anything, it's not even programming. And simultaneously, you have another group of people who say it's too powerful and it keeps programming things I don't expect it to. It keeps applying my selectors to places that it shouldn't. Um, th the difference with CSS is that these are actually the same group of people. It's actually, there's no Venn diagram there. Um, so are there any ways I can encapsulate CSS without filthy JavaScript. Let's say we do want to encapsulate CSS. I can think of one reason I would want to do this. Um, and that is when I'm writing documentation for a design system, and I want to embed a live demo, but I don't want the documentation styles, the styles for the documentation site itself, to conflict with the live demo that's um, embedded in it. Um, and there's a few ways to do this. There's style queries, there's declarative shadow DOM, and there's at scope, which is something that Unit touched on earlier. Um, with style queries, this is one that Manuel um, suggested to me a little while ago, actually. And I think it's kind of neat in some ways, and it's not just for the scoping thing. So if you put an arbitrary style and associate that with a container, and that style doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't even have to be valid, uh, necessarily. But that's like this cipher which, which says, within this container, apply this CSS. And then you can use your simple selectors. So you don't have to generate classes or be careful about your namespacing and all of that stuff, because it will just do it for you. Um, and what's neat about that, I think, is that you can reuse some of those, um, some of those styles. Uh, so you can just say, I want the scope for card one to apply to this element or these elements or whatever. And it's kind of, I don't know, it has kind of a mixing quality where you can take blocks of CSS and reuse them in that way kind of nice and composable. So then there's declarative shadow DOM. So shadow DOM sounds like a really cool thing. It sounds like a BDSM themed uh, metal band. Declarative shadow DOM makes it sound less cool, um, but is in fact more cool because it gets rid of JavaScript, which is what everyone wants. Um, and it's it simply works like this kind of, if you've worked with web components and shadow DOM, you have your slots, you, have your, um, you can embed your styles in there, and it just works by using a template and using this uh, this attribute here. So that's one way you can do it as well. And then there's scope, which again was touched on before. I'm not going to get into it too much. But uh, oh, I would say that scope originally um, was just like a attribute like this. And if you've used Vue, they kind of polyfilled it in a way um, and applied it. But as I said, in Vue, 
they then uh, did the JavaScript thing of, of uh, programming the randomized classes. It's not, it's not native. But there was supposed to be a native version of it. There kind of was, and then it didn't get, uh, it didn't get supported by many browsers, and then it got removed from the spec, I think. Um, so it went away, and a lot of people were quite sad, including me, because where I really wanted to have scope cells, which isn't very often, but where I really want to have it, I could just do this. I could just do scoped attribute, put that on the on the style element, and I'm done. It just scopes it to its nearest um, ancestor element, so that scopes the styles to class example here. But because we don't have that natively, then what we had to end up doing was find a COVID denier, get them to invent JavaScript, wait for a uh, sexist privacy breaching hot or not up to turn into Facebook, then React, then style components. With the CSS Scopulation Enterprise Max AI <laughs> Uh, library that I created, I got round some of this stuff, but not all of it. Unfortunately, you still have the COVID deny JavaScript part. You just don't have to deal with the Facebook and the React parts. Um, and it's it's you know it's a neat syntax, and I really like the scope two thing. And uh, I talked to Miriam about this. Like it confused me to begin with because two I thought it meant to scope to the content element, but it means it kind of means until. So yeah, it's it's a powerful piece of stuff. Um, don't talk a lot about at scope on uh, Twitter um, using uh, the at scope uh, handle, because it's at scope, it will match. Uh, because basically, you'll just create a lot of noise for this organization called Scope, who are an organization in the UK who um, are helping to fight for disability rights. So you're just going to cause a lot of uh, uh, noise for them, and you're going to want to avoid that. Um, the thing that all of these things, um, all of these techniques don't deal with and it was something that confused me about Shadow DOM to begin with, because I thought it would apply, but it doesn't. So they don't eliminate inheritance. Um, so you're really just writing selectors in an automated way. You're not encapsulating things fully um, because of inheritance, because inheritance can still affect the styles from further up the tree, right? Um, just to disambiguate, there are two types of inheritance in uh, Web development, the first kind is HTML elements inferring which styles should apply to them automatically. And the second is money Danny gives you to use as seed capital for your startup, for which you hire a number of people more skilled than you, then claim all the credit and all the profits. One of these types of inheritance is quite popular among the software and uh, web development communities. One, not so much. Um, so what I'm saying is that when you use scoping using one of these mechanisms, whether it's JavaScript, whether it's CSS, you are stopping the styles from getting out of your component and infecting other components, but you're still letting styles in. And when you're letting styles something in, but you're not letting stuff come out, then it's, it's constipation. So it's like saying CSS has constipation. And the only reason I'm saying that is because I just feel like I'm the first person to have observed that and said, CSS has constipation. I always check to see if that's the case when I come up with something like that. I put it in the quotes and put it in Google. Um, and I think I'm right because Google suggested that I was talking about my cat having constipation. I didn't have a cat, um, so we're safe there. Um, I did also, one result really confused me. There's an organization called CSS who are, a, I think they're like a, they're a Zurich uh, like medical insurance organization or something. Maybe some of you will be familiar with them. They happen to have an information page about constipation. So I stared at that blinking for a little while, thinking, wondering what was going on. Um, so you can, you can sort of undo inheritance. There's a few ways to do that, and the all keyword is really helpful for that. But it's not exactly as you might imagine, because I expect it to bring things back to just the user agent styles. But it will take all of that off as well. So it goes back to before that. It goes back to the primordial element, which happens to be um, an inline element, which is why I tend to use this. If I'm doing this kind of thing, I'll do all initial, and then I'll do display revert. So the display revert part um, makes it so that you kind of build that back in again. Um, the only way, the only way to actually, without having to undo anything, just to, from the off the bat, just get rid of all of the uh, inheritance on any kind of styling polluting one way or the other is just to take the elements out of the page itself. Seems like an obvious answer. If you don't put the elements in the page to start with, they can't inherit from the page. So there is one way of doing that, um, which I've come across recently, and that's to use this. It's a frame set and a couple of frame elements. And so what we have is that you have your left.html and your right.html. 
They're like your components, if you like. They're not inheriting from the page because they're not fucking in the page because they're, they're their own pages. Um, and they're definitely not passing styles between each other as well. Um, frame is really well supported as well, as you can see. I, think I looked at this for a little while and then I realized that support for frame in IE 6 to 10 is unknown, <laughs> which is, <laughs> surely we know that that was there, don't we, but I don't know. Um, then Apple came along, they acquired Frame, and it became iFrame to go along with all of their other iProducts. That's a very sort of broad joke for me, but I thought I'd put it in there anyway. Um, and with the iFrame, it's really cool because you can use source doc. And the cool thing about source doc is you have this code um, co-location thing where you're, you're kind of building a component where it's all there. You can see it in front of yourself. You've got your style, you've got your HTML, it's all encapsulated in this one block. It's like a React component, but there's no JavaScript. Um, there are a couple of minor issues with using, I'm, uh, for the record, I'm recommending you make all of your components in all of your design systems iframes at all times. That's what I'm telling you today at CSS Day 2023. Where's the camera? Yeah. But there are a couple of minor issues that you're going to have to get around. And the first minor issue is this. If you're using double quotes for the attribute itself, then you have to use single quotes in all of your attributes inside it, which is gross, right? That's pretty unpleasant. Um, but you know, you can do that. You can, you can get something to automate that for you, I suppose. The other problem, and it is only a minor problem, but the other problem is that now all of your components are all 150 pixels high, um, no matter what content you put inside them. Um, unless, unless you do involve JavaScript, of course. Uh, you need to know when to run the JavaScript. When the iframe resizes, you have to resize it around the contents or use Mutation Observer as well when you're adding and removing elements so you can add all that back in. But I mean, just have a conversation with the UX designer. Just see if you can get them to accept uh, components being 150 pixels high at all times because otherwise you've got, a, you've got another dependency, haven't you, um, with your JavaScript. Uh, and yeah, you get through there. You get the, you have to find a homophobe, COVID denier, and weird crypto person, and um, get them to invent JavaScript. Then wait for someone to specify and create mutation observer and resize observer, and then you've got to wait for the browser adoption. That's a longer route. Talk to the UX people. Um, so so far, I've covered uh, why scoping CSS isn't really desirable 98% of the time, and why CSS like scope. When we talk about CSS not scoping, really the important thing is that it does um, in ways that. Uh, more useful than the kind of artificial scoping uh, that we're trying to trying to do now, I think. Um, the second thing was how to go about scoping CSS anyway, because let's face it, we're more interested in what we can do than what we should be doing. That's kind of our sort of industry calling card. And now third, I'm just briefly going to touch on was CSS itself a mistake, as suggested by the person who wrote that bizarre reply uh, to, uh, to Manuel. So here's a little story. First, you have a button. And you take that button and you make it your own. Because you have CSS, you can style that button, right? Um, and then you make some more buttons. Because you can use different selectors. You can apply classes. You can make it so they're differentiated in the HTML. You've got different hooks. You can do all of this stuff with these buttons. Um, and then you scope those styles to make absolutely sure that none of them start to look like each other, because you wouldn't want that. Then a design systems consultant is hired. And the first thing they tell you is you have too many different buttons. That is literally the first thing I always end up saying as a design systems consultant. You've got too many fucking buttons. What are you doing? There's buttons everywhere. They're all different shapes and sizes and colors. Like, what's wrong with you? Um, then you, find you have to get a UX person to try and find out which button performs best. And they use all sorts of really scientific ways of determining whether a button is a good button, like tracking people's eye movements and weird shit like that. Um, and then, and this is the thing, when you're a, when you're a front end developer who works on a design system, you're basically not coding, you're mostly having conversations and it's mostly politics. So if you're as good at communication and persuasion as you are at CSS, you might after some months or years, and it really, I've worked at big organizations with design systems, it can take years literally for different departments to all adopt your, your button component or whatever the component is. Get everyone, you'll, hopefully in the end you'll get everyone to use it. But the problem remains, and that is that your button is still different from all the other buttons out there across all the other websites made by all the other people in their organizations, which is worth thinking about, I think. While you believe in things like creativity and liberty, you have to conclude that if everyone was forced to use the same button styling everywhere, 
You would need to hire expensive design systems and UX consultants to work on them, and much more importantly, everyone would find the web a lot easier to use because they'd know what to expect. Because when it comes down to it, nobody cares what your buttons look like, only that they look like buttons, and every time you apply CSS to a button, you undo that. I thought, to begin with, it would be funny to end the talk just on that note and then just walk off stage. <laughs> but um, so on a serious note, like what's great about this conference is we get to talk about all of the exciting new things which are coming to CSS. And there is so much at the moment. My head was spinning watching Yuna's talk. And there's going to be loads more to come tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it. But what I wanted to say is that it's not, CSS isn't epochal. Like, you, you don't have, as soon as something new comes along, you don't have to shed the old things. It's all about building on foundations, and the fundamentals of the web are still what's the important thing. The thing that Tim Berners-Lee came up with was, an, uh, was the ability for us to share information for free. And as much as I love playing with CSS animations and blend modes and all of that stuff, that's the really important thing, and that's worth remembering, I think. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with a video here, which is kind of uh, it's a video that I came up with, which is just a little reminder about the, cons the consistent fundamentals of the web. Um, let me just find that for you. Here you go. What is Web 3.0? Web 1.0 was, is, a system of interconnected documents traversable by hyperlink. However, Web Dieu full stop nout was, is, a system of interconnected documents traversable by hyperlink. On the other hand, Web Dry dot zilch is a system of interconnected documents traversable by hyperlink. Should you wish to upgrade to Web 3.1, expect a system of interconnected documents traversable by hyperlink. If we ever get to Web 95, you can bet your sweet ass it will be a system of fucking interconnected documents traversable by fucking hyperlink. Dude, I loved it. I'll go, yeah. yeah, you gotta come over here now. Yeah, sorry. Gotta face the audience yeah. after that. <laughs> I feel really exposed sitting on this stool. Uh, me too. I'm glad you showed a web brief. Thank you, yeah. I'm so, what I'm trying to do is, um, I was doing like six or seven minute videos, uh, which I called web, which I'm calling webbed briefs. Uh, but it takes, as it turns out, about one and a half weeks to, <laughs> like put together and edit a six to seven minute black and white animation, or at least it does for me. So now I'm doing much shorter videos. So I'm hopefully gonna be putting out a lot more. I have one which is a sort of an ethnographic study of different loading indicators, which I'm working on at the moment. Um, <laughs> so it's like choose your favorite loading indicator. Um, and I've got one uh, which is about uh, self-documenting code and how that works, and basically the answer is you fucking document it yourself. That's why it's called self-documenting code, <laughs> by writing comments in it. Uh, and yeah, and a few more, which are in the pipeline. So hope, hopefully I'll be able to have a, what do they call it, a better cadence, and do, yeah, do more, more frequently. Delightful, and it's so popular right now to do a one minute movie, because people have no time, I guess. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the TikTok generate. I sound so old saying that, don't I? It's the TikTok generation, that's what it is. Could have called it like Tiki Talkie. Tiki Talkie. <laughs> uh, there's a really important few questions in here. Uh, this one is, what's your favorite kind of crab and why? Uh, yeah, no, that is, that is a good question. Yeah, my favorite type of crab, oh, fuck, that's really hard. I, I mean, some days it's a horseshoe crab because they have blue blood and they have eyes on the back of their body as well as the front, which is pretty Sick. cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they've been around since before dinosaur times, and you still, they unevolved, they'd still, they're perfect. They are evolutionarily perfect, even though they have eyes on the back of their body in the front. I mean, um, I want that. But it, well, yeah, it works for them, so, yeah. So they're good, um, <laughs> they're good, they're good crabs. Um, and boxer crabs I really like, because they literally wear 
uh, jellyfish as boxing gloves. I have so much to learn. It's like a symbiotic relationship. So that they punch predators <laughs> with, the, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the jellyfish. <laughs> but then the bits of flake that come off the predator, uh, like the flakes of their scales or their skin or whatever, then the jellyfish can then eat. So it's sort of like tit for tat, yeah. It hurts so good, you know, <laughs> yeah. keep punching him, I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, kinky, I think, yeah, as in the, in the crap world. There's probably a metaphor for that in the web somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, multiple people wanted to tell you what the section sign was, that the double S-E. Oh, thing. thank you. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's no way of looking it up, is there? Or oh, unless I just type the character into Google. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you planted that. You knew that people were going to no, be like, I, oh, I, let me. Let I me. literally just couldn't be bothered to. I thought, I've got a room full of people. I'll just ask. I oh, was, I thought yeah. it was a hook and bait. And you were just like, gotcha. I wanted you to mansplain it. I knew it the whole time. No. Because <laughs> I'm just projecting. Good guess, though. <laughs> Um, here, oh, is this one real? This is, this is a real question. It's a real question. It's a real one. Should we encourage designers to learn CSS? <laughs> I mean, I guess that wasn't, a, no, it's real. It's real. I think you were stopping because it suddenly got really rude or something. <laughs> no, that's it. That's the question. Should we encourage should, designers, should designers to learn, learn CSS? CSS? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think not knowing CSS isn't a prerequisite for being, if you see what I mean, you can be a designer who can write CSS anyway. So I write CSS, and for a long time, people don't realize this, but for long, I, I had an art degree. I didn't study computer science or anything. Like, I came into it because I did like graphic art, and then it became doing websites and things. And so um, I, I learned CSS as a tool for doing designing. And that's how I see design. As design is a thought process, and it's a discipline, and it's just it's a very abstract thing where you're just trying to achieve something. And you pick up tools along the way to do that, right? So. Figma might be a tool, or, or um, Photoshop might be a tool, but also CSS could be a tool. So, yeah, you, I don't know if they should, but they could. I, I think <laughs> that's a good answer. Yeah, it's about expression and the amount of fidelity you want to bring to the expression. Like, mm. if a designer is trying to really hone in and articulate themselves at the finest detail, well, then you might want to pick up the end medium. If you're working in yeah. a state where you're being asked to do things quickly, you can produce the ideal picture of the result and then ask one of us to do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been in both those roles where I've been the person who someone tells me exactly how they want the design to look and then I have to um, recreate it in CSS, which is, you know, really difficult or, I mean, it's getting easier because um, uh, browser engines and things are aligning more, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, the pixel perfection thing is hard um, and should be avoided as much as possible. But I've also been the person who's just created things with CSS and just like designed in CSS, like don't even go to Photoshop or where, whatever it is first, go directly into CSS and work with that. Um, and there's an element of design in, in, the, in the interpretation of someone else's design with CSS as well to get meta about it. So there's always design. I mean, I always say that you have to design a database don't you like you need to, if you've got a relational database there's design in how you organize it otherwise it will be inefficient so that's design work as well so we have this weird boundary between people who do code yeah the boundaries are so dumb because yeah. you've got yeah software design and you could be designing some back-end architecture and somehow that makes you as a designer magically different than a yeah. designer that's pushing s pixels around I don't I don't know why the lines yeah get made exactly that way. well it's when ridiculous. we say designer I think we mean graphic designer um, and it's come to sort of mean person who does the Figma stuff now, I guess. <laughs> so, um, and that's a very narrow way of looking at design. You could be a haberdasher. That's designing hats, right? I think. Yeah. Today I learned. <laughs> <Right>. Thank you. <laughs> um, I uh, was talking to someone recently, and yeah, the pixel perfect thing is, is really frustrating when what we're actually delivering is a compromise. We're, we're saying here is some suggestions for the page. Uh, you're not forced to use any of them. In fact, you have lots of control, and you can bring your personality, your preferences, and all sorts of shit to the table and make it yours. And that's one of the superpowers, is the focus on pixel perfection is not the scalable solution to consuming content. Yep. So, anyway, that's a rant. Yeah, you end up spending so much effort just chasing those little tiny things, which people wouldn't end up noticing anyway. You know, like things being one pixel misaligned in one browser, like who cares? Um, yeah. Uh, there's a, a cool, and I don't know if it's true. I mean, people can write whatever the hell they want in the form. 
Uh, it's Tim Berners-Lee's birthday today. Is it really? <laughs> I did not know that. I mean, we're not in speaking terms. <laughs> <laughs> Send him an email, be like, holler, <laughs> I put you on my slides today. Mm. Oh, someone asked what happened to me chanting CSS, CSS, CSS. The mic was off. I tried. Oh, you did, you did chant it as I you did approached the stage. I did chant it. Okay, um, well, that's, that's reassuring. Yeah. It, I've been having so much fun. That, that was just for me. Uh, okay, let's see. We got, will your unstyled button component be part of the next React.js release? <laughs> I'm keen to use it, an excited framework user. Well, that's a good question. So first of all, that question is based on the misconception. And that misconception is that, um, that React is made of HTML. No, React is an entirely different thing. When you see like JSX, that's not HTML at all. There's like none of those attributes or any of those elements that isn't HTML or anything. When it, when it gets compiled and it works in the browser, it's not even HTML. Like the browser does something else. I don't know what it does, but it, it passes React directly. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a custom element namespace that I really liked and I'm struggling to remember it. Um, it was really tongue in cheek. It was like, something dash, but it was like one letter each. I don't know, do you remember? Oh, no, so what I did do for a while, I had this little declarative prototyping library where I used web components, but the idea was just so you could like mock up um, designs really, you know, um, like you had card components and things like, like a wireframing thing. Um, and I decided that the best thing to do was for each component, it was just a dash after the first letter. Oh yeah, D dash if, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. a div, it would be d dash if, <laughs> d dash, yeah, d dash if. I mean, it should have been um, but dash on, that would have been great. Oh, well, in my system, um, it would be but at on. <laughs> Touche. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's it for our questions. Anything you want to tell people or, uh, I don't know, what kind of shit do you want to shoot right now? No, I mean, I am unemployed, uh, so... <laughs> 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 So if anyone has any leads, I'm not interested in being employed. I mean, I'm freelance, right? but uh, yeah, work, work's good. Yeah. Do you have any briefs that are webbed? Oh, like actual briefs that are webbed? I used to have some swimming trunks which had that kind of uncomfortable lining. Oh, yeah, lining that in shitty them. mesh. Yeah. yeah, that stuff sucks. I got yeah. rid of those. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And that's it. I think that's, uh, that's Thanks, the Adam. question. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>